gang, Jeff McAleer once again, and I am here at home in Mishawaka, Indiana. It's been a rainy day, kind of a gloomy evening, and what better time to bust out some games, bring them to the table, than on days and evenings like this. And tonight, I'm taking a look at a new design from our friends over at GMT Games that looks mighty cool, and it's been creating quite a bit of buzz. And it's Mark Herman's new design, Churchill. So let's jump inside and take a peek to see everything when we pull it outside the box. Back inside I have Mark Herman's Churchill Big Three Struggle for Peace on the table. And I'm really excited to take a look at this game because I've heard a lot of great things about it. Herman doesn't design a whole lot of games. So this is a big release for GMT. Taking a look at the back of the box here. There's some discussion that this isn't a war game and it doesn't play like a traditional war game. And just by taking a look at the graphics for the map or the game board, obviously we'll show you that's not the case. This is not a hex and counters kind of game. It's for one to three players. Obviously it's going to play best with three players because each of those players are going to represent one of the major allies of World War II. So you've got the United States, Great Britain, and Russia. It's rated number two in complexity, so it's very low complexity according to GMT, and Solitaire's suitability is rated a nine. Let's get this open, and this is a pretty hefty box, pretty large size box. Let's take a look to see what we've got inside. And I did take the shrink off a little earlier. That's why it's kind of difficult to get this open because I did not open it. Just pulled the shrink off. So we've got the rules of play, a book here, and uh, looks like it's gonna clock in around probably uh, 34 pages or so. Just taking a quick look through the introduction, key concepts of the game, talking about the various different counters and cards. Herman is well known for designing games that are card driven. I'm a big fan of card driven games as well. Just kind of flipping through real quick. Not a whole lot of graphics that I can see so far in the rule book. Well, there's a few. The way the game is broken up, from what I understand, is each of the players are going to take part in 10 different conferences which took place during World War II. And what you're going to do is you're looking to not only defeat the Axis powers, obviously enough, but you want to make sure that you put your nation in the best post-war footing. There are various scenarios involved, and they can range in 90 minutes uh, in gameplay for you to be able to uh, just learn the game. And then there's a full game, and then there's a campaign. And I believe the campaign can last from four to five hours. So a good, meaty experience. We're looking at just some of the rules and designer notes. Uh, historical issue, appendix, and background. I think for the most part, you're looking at that beating the Axis is kind of a foregone conclusion in this game. So, that was the rule book. Oh, looks like there's some stickers. Oh, look at the old bulldog himself. Love Winston Churchill. If you ever have an opportunity, uh, you need to really read uh, William Manchester's uh, three-book biography of Churchill. Although Manchester did pass away before he finished the third book, but it is out now. Very, very good reading. Looks like we've got some player aids here. I'm going to take a guess we've got three. So, sequence of play, victory point schedule... The Roosevelt bot, the Churchill bot, and the Stalin bot. Because obviously if you're playing the solitaire and uh, you need something to determine the AI, 
for the other two allies. So here we go. We got the three player aids, and then we've got some counter sheets. Take a closer look here. Dual sided. This is really a geopolitical game overall. Taking a look at these are dual sided, of course. And then we've got the map, which we'll take a closer look at in just a minute. We have various different wooden cubes and cylinders and blocks. I'm going to take a guess some of these blocks. We'll get those stickers that we were just taking a look at. Huh. Interesting. Some little plastic, almost like bingo counters. Not used to seeing those in a GMT game, that's for sure. A ten-sided die. Some six-sided dice. Oh, look. So we've got the U.S. is blue, Great Britain's green, Soviets are red. An obvious guess there. Got the baggies for your counters and such. GMT's always really good about doing that. We've got some decks of cards as well. So looking at like the USSR, the conference, UK, as well as USA. And these are staff decks, except for the conference decks. So we're going to take a look at that in just a minute, too. So we've got the box there. Give me a sec. I'm going to open up the shrink on the cards, and I'm going to lay the map out. So we're going to take a closer look at the map where all the gameplay is going to take place. You can see that this is a pretty large game board. I know I mentioned it was a map before, but it really isn't a map. It's a game board, and it's broken up into some sections here. So we have the conference display as well as the military display. And if we take a look here, the military display is broken up into the Eastern Theater as well as the Pacific Theater. Taking a look at the conference, each of the three allies feel like they have various issues that they're going to try to address during each of the conferences. And there is a victory point track as well. One thing that I found very interesting from what I've heard, having the most victory points does not necessarily assure you of victory in this game. That it's more important that you're pretty much the best ally and that you've set yourself up and your nation up for the best post-war situation. So if we take a look a little closer in at the Pacific Theater Command, and it's interesting because those of you who are very familiar with the Second World War, do you understand that one of the issues that the United States faced was that the Soviets weren't all that concerned with the Pacific Theater. They were more concerned with the European theater and opening up a second front against Hitler. Great Britain fell into this category a bit too. They weren't overly concerned about the Pacific either. So just kind of taking a scan of the board itself, let's take a much closer look at the cards. I've taken the four decks and, and removed their shrink wrap and we do have the conference deck, the U.S. staff deck, U.K. staff deck, as well as the U.S.S.R. staff deck. Let's take a little closer look at these as well. As I had mentioned, the game focuses on 10 different conferences during the war. And I can't say for certain if you're going to... Well, I'm going to take a guess because I see one, two, three, four... You're probably going to take each of these and possibly select one of the three cards. There might be some random variation as far as each of the conferences. Can't say for sure. So we've got Casablanca, Washington, Quebec, Cairo, Tehran, London, 
Quebec once again, Moscow, Yalta, and then finally Potsdam. That shows when these each took place as well. Kind of taking a look here, and it appears it's showing a specific event that's going to be important. Kind of getting an idea too. So, just kind of a thought that you might randomly select one of the three cards to represent what's going on at that conference itself. Taking a look at the U.S. staff deck, it's going to show various different advisors, secretaries, like Frank Knox, who was the Secretary of the Navy. And I believe during each of the conferences, you'll have a hand of cards that you can utilize that you have staff available to you to help kind of push your issues through. Just taking a look. And it appears anywhere from a value of five to one. And then you actually have the leader himself. From what I hear, like for an example, we've got Franklin D. Roosevelt, we have Harry S. Truman. If you utilize your actual leader's card, there's a possibility that something negative could happen. So Roosevelt could die and be replaced by Harry S. Truman. So I'll kind of give you an example there. Churchill, I believe, if you utilize his card and something goes wrong, he has a heart attack and he actually misses the next conference. As far as with Stalin, if you screw up, then Stalin actually gets very paranoid and there's a bit of a mini purge within the USSR staff. So you'll probably have to discard Russian staff. Just taking a quick look through. It looks very, very interesting. This game, like I said, it's getting great word of mouth. And uh, I'm really excited to get this to the table and take a good look at it. And finally, we'll just take a quick fan through the USSR staff deck. Now, I'm not sure if, like many card-driven games, if these numbers here represent like operational points that you can utilize. So you could use the staff member either as operations points or to utilize some special skills or not. So once I actually dive into the game, I will find out. And there's Stalin himself. There we go. So those are the decks of cards as well. Now Churchill is currently available and you can pick it up from any of your finer retailers or from the GMT website itself. It does carry an $89 MSRP, so it is a bit pricier than many of the GMT releases by about $20 or so. But you have to keep in mind, this is a Mark Herman design and it's not as if Mr. Herman is out there every month or couple of months or year coming out with a new game. So this is a big release, as I mentioned, for GMT. So there you have it. That's what we've got in Churchill when we take everything outside the box. By all means, if you'd like to learn more about Churchill or any of the other GMT games out there, go to gmtgames.com. Once again, this is Jeff McAleer and Feel free to swing on over to thegaminggang.com for the latest in geek news and reviews. And until my next video, thanks for watching.